Okay, and welcome to Chapel Baptist Church's Wednesday evening service. Thank you for tuning in by way of YouTube. I pray that you are doing well tonight. As of right now, our church doors will not open until the beginning of May. So I hope that you are marking your calendars, that hopefully by that point, we will be all together once again. I am looking forward to it, and I hope you are as well. Let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing on our service tonight. Father, we thank you so much for the time that we could spend together in your word. Thank you for the time that we could worship you through spirit and in truth. Help us to worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Help us wherever we find ourselves in our needs. Help us to, to look to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Open your Bible with me to 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1. We'll be looking at verse number 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. This is a very familiar text that we have here for us and our consideration tonight. But remember that we should remind ourselves of the great truths that Scripture has for each and every one of us so that we don't forget what we already know. Notice with me in verse number 9 of chapter 1, 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this evening you have given us. We ask you to bless it. Bless the word to our lives. May we become more and more conformed into the image of Christ. Help us to love you most in our life. Help us to love others as Christ loved us. Help us love our families. Help us love our church. Help us love those that are lost. Help us to love them to Jesus. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll say a word, and you say the first thing that comes to mind when you think of this word. Ready? Revival. Now, many people, what comes instantly to mind is that an evangelist has come into town and is going to be doing a week of meetings, and that is called a revival meeting. Now, true, that, that could be a definition of revival, Others would think that a, a revival is when the, the nation of America gets right with God or, or whatever country gets right with God and things happen and, and now legislation happens that it is more biblical and more people are getting saved throughout the entire nation and a revival sweeps over the entire nation. I think of the, the Welsh revival. This man, he was... 29 years old, he was studying to be a, be, be a minister, and then he got the conviction of he wanted to preach some revival meetings. And so he started preaching, and not many people showed up. But eventually, and eventually, as many people were praying, more and more people came each and every day night and he was asked to go other places to preach and many people came to know Christ and and revival swept over the entire nation of of uh, Wales and and all of that said he only spent a few months in ministry and then the rest of his life he was in private ministry to a local church but a revival uh, you think of revival I think of uh, in this early 1700s, Jonathan Edwards preached the sinner, sinners in the hand of the angry God. That sermon. And it created such a, a wave of revival that all of New England, it seemed like, you know, two out of three people were saved and back into church. And so revival happens very quickly. Revival happens over a large period of, of, of space, of people, of people integrating with each other and many people doing what they ought to do. But simple revival is, is very simply put, getting back to normal. Getting back to normal. The normacy of the Christian life. It should be a norm, normal Christian life for, for a Christian to pray. A pray diligently. It should be a normal part of a Christian's life to read their Bible daily. And not only to read it, but to delight in it. It should be a normal thing in a daily in a Christian's life to witness. It should be a normal thing for a Christian to do many things that are set in Scripture. But yet more and more, as I see in my own life, a revival needs to happen on a daily basis for me. A revival happens and begins with individuals. So if I'm revived and you that are listening and, and watching are revived, the more and more we are, 
the more and more other Christians would catch the fire. If one Christian was on fire for God, then others will look, marvel, and say, man, I wish I was like that. And then they learn, and they get on fire themselves, and then somebody else looks at that, and, and they want to be like that, and, and fire catches very quickly. It's like you know, lighting a match and dropping it in a forest. It can consume a forest in a matter of hours, minutes, seconds. So how can we have a revival in our own personal lives? The missing thing for revival, from what I have understood from the scriptures, is found in ver verse number 9 of John chapter 1. It says, or 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, confession. Confession is the key in order for Christians to individually be right with God and to walk pleasingly with Him. Let me read that again. Confession is the key in order for Christians to individually be right with God and to walk pleasingly with Him. What confession is, simply is, is saying the same thing as God. You agree with God concerning your sin. So the, the two questions that might come to mind, simple. Why should I confess? How should I confess? Why should I confess? And how should I confess? So we're going to look at, first of all, why. Three reasons why we should confess with our, uh, we should confess our sins. Number one, we have sin from our first man. We have sin from our first man. Look with me in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8, and verse number 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse number 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The first thing that we realize here uh, from the epistle of First John, and in fact all the epistles, uh, simply that all the epistles are written for born again believers in Christ. Those who are actually saved, who are actually heaven bound, that is what, what they need to know in order to progress in their Christian walk. That's why we have the epistles. You might ask me, well, what do lost people need to read? They need to read the Gospels. They need to get saved. The Gospel of John is probably the number one place where most pastors and most uh, older Christians would say for a new believer to go to first is the Gospel of John. To know Jesus and to know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amazing. So first we realize that this is written to Christians not to unbelievers. Notice with me in verse number 8, it says, if we, it's not if you. If you say you have no sin. No, John uses we. If we say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In verse number 10, if we, if we once again, say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Two things that happen if we say we do not have sin in our lives is first we deceive ourselves. We lie to ourselves. But not only that, worse though, in verse 10, we make him, that's God, a liar. We make God a liar. So we need to confess our sin because we have sin from our first man. Meaning, we were born into this world sinners. You can't dispute that. Well, you can't. You could, you're just not going to win. It's a losing battle if you try to do so. Why? Because from a very early age, we all know that we were born sinners. How so? 
A baby, if they do not get what they want when they want, what happens? They cry. Now, true enough, it's understandable. They need to be changed. They need to be fed. But in all reality, if they want something and they don't get it, and it's not a necessity, they start crying. What happens when they become toddlers? They throw a tantrum. <laughs> you and I have both seen the scene. We're in the grocery store. We're getting to go to the checkout. We have a few things. We put it on the conveyor belt. And all of a sudden, we hear from the other side of the, the store, a toddler or an adolescent that do not get what they want. They start screaming. They start hitting people, they start hitting their parents, they start doing and uh, using all filthy language in order to get what they want. They throw themselves on the floor and, and kick and scream and, and uh, huh, that poor parent. I feel so bad for them. But you think, early age, it shows that we have a sinful nature. Uh, from a baby, they cry. They, for a toddler, they uh, they have a tantrum for teenagers. They times rebel. But we have a sinful nature because we're born with one from our first man. From Adam, who in the beginning, everything was perfect. He had one command to follow, and he rebelled against God. From that point on, everybody that was born of Adam and Eve, or from man and woman, was born with a sinful nature. Just how it is. Oh, but don't worry, I've been saved. This is what saved people have to deal with. If we say that we have no sin. If we say we have not sinned. If we, as Christian believers, if we say we have not sinned, these things are true. That we are deceiving ourselves and that we're calling God a liar who it's impossible for him to lie. Wow. We have the new nature in Christ. What that means is that our new nature in Christ does not obliterate the old nature. To put it in another way, our new nature and our old nature are budding heads. It's warfare. It's the things that we do to make the difference between which one wins out. So, it's not obliterating the old nature. We still have that old nature, that old sinful nature, that if we're not diligent, if we're not careful, we tend to fall right back into old patterns. And we see that over and over and over again. That's why confession is needed. So number one, the first reason why we need to confess our sins is because we have sinned from our first man. Secondly, we need to have fellowship with God. The second reason why we should confess our sins is we need to have fellowship with God. Notice with me in verse number 5 of 1 John chapter 1. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we, born again believers, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, and we lie. And do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You notice with me that two natures are displayed here. It says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. John makes the analogy light versus darkness. Light is the perfection that God is, that God has. He is absolutely perfect. He is absolutely holy. There's nothing wrong in his nature. He is light. And it says that there is no darkness whatsoever in God. But yet, then it says, if we walk in darkness and we say we are having fellowship with God, what are we doing? We lie. We are lying and do not the truth. So light is over here. It's perfection. 
Darkness is over here. It's everything but perfection. It's any imperfection at all. God is absolutely perfect. There's no imperfections in him at all. We're born with a sinful nature. There's no perfections in us at all. And so that's why we need Jesus, because we couldn't get to the light without someone who is perfect putting upon us his own righteousness. That's what Jesus Christ did. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we need fellowship with God. We have the, the right to have that because of our new nature in Jesus Christ. We're righteous in God's sight. But the problem is, some go walking in the darkness because they're in their flesh, they're in their old nature. They want to do that which is evil instead of that which is good where God is. So we need to have fellowship with God. It says in Amos chapter 3, verse number 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? The answer is no. You cannot have fellowship if you are not agreed in how you walk and where you're walking to. All these different things add up. If you walk very quickly and the person you're walking with walks very slowly, you are not having fellowship. If you two are walking at two different destinations, Taking two different routes, you're not having fellowship. You think about it, fellowship. I think of having fellowship with my wife. It's a wonderful thing. I love spending time with her. I love being in her presence. I love talking with her. I love showing her how much I love her by doing various things around the house without being asked. Gentlemen, that's the trick. Do something before she is upset with you and asks you to do something. Do something because you love her. Fellowship with your spouse. That's what it's like. You could also have fellowship with your kids. You think about it, all the fun that you've had in the past. Me and my kids, we like to play different things. Right now, we are amusing ourselves with playing a video game. And yes, a video game could be a very fun time with me and the and my boys. Happy doesn't really care at this point in time. But in all reality, we're having fellowship. What happens when one of my boys does something that displeases me? Are we still having fellowship? The answer is no, because correction is needed. And that correction strains that relationship. It hinders the relationship because what he, what the other person did it to displease the one, displease the one so that it strains the relationship in the first place and then correction happens. And then if correction is not well received, then that strains it even more and even more. Just like with God. God is absolutely perfect. God is absolutely righteous. And we, if we get off the right path to walk in the way we shouldn't, then God corrects us. If we, if we agree with him, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to restore us to that right fellowship. It's a wonderful thing to remember that we can have fellowship with Almighty God. The third reason why we, need, we, we should confess our sins so that we need to have a clean heart. We need to have a clean heart. Look with me at verse number 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we do not confess our sins, we are rather dirty. When I think of being dirty, I think of when I was a kid. One point in time, we used to go to Iowa every single summer on a family vacation, me and my parents and my brother. We would go to my grandparents' house and stay over their house, and then we do many different things, one of which I don't remember exactly what it was for, uh, but I remember going to this place. It was really boring, 
and I saw that there was a playground right outside, and me and my brother asked my mom and dad whether or not we could go out and play on the playground. And they said, sure, that's fine, no problem. So we went out. And the only problem was the night before, it rained. And this playground wasn't covered with like mulch, what we see today. It was just grass, which if you get grass and a moist ground, what do you get? Mud. And so, me and my brother would be on the swing set. We would jump off the swing set, and guess what? Splat. Right into mud. And we would get on the, 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 the nice uh, slide that they had there, and guess what happened? You slid down and you came off, and uh, if you landed, no problem. If you didn't, splat. And the more and more fun we had, the more and more we went splat. And you could just imagine my mom's reaction to seeing both me and my brother absolutely dirty. Absolutely dirty. Well, I remember it was not a pleasant thing ride back to my grandparents' house. We changed our clothes there, and uh, we went on with our activities. But you think about it. Every sin that you do, you are dirty before God. Now, true enough, positionally before me and God, he sees nothing but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Because 2,000 years ago, when, when Jesus died for me, he saw me instead of Christ. He died in my place. But now on a day-to-day -day practical level, I need to have a clean heart. I need to have a clean mind so that God could cleanse me from my unrighteousness, which I have done, and restore me to good fellowship with him. You need to have a clean heart. You need to have a clean heart. So we saw the why, now we're going to see the how. How to have, how do we do confession? How do we have confession? Four steps to have, a conf to have confession before God. Number one, we need to pray. We need to pray that God, through the Holy Spirit, shows us our sin. David wrote about this in Psalm 139, verse number 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Think about it. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Five different ways to say basically the same thing. God Know me. God, show me what is wrong in my life. And notice, and then lead me in the way everlasting. Show me the dirt I have in my sin. Show me what I have done wrong. Show me what is wrong between me and you. And help me to be led on, back on the path by which you want me to walk. Confession is there, and the first step is for you to say, God, show me my sin. Use the whole, through the Holy Spirit that lives within me, show me where I am wrong. It might be pride. Show me where I'm wrong. It might be a bad attitude. You know, I, I realize that some people, you know, they don't wake up the same. Me, I am a morning person. That means 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, I naturally wake up. Some of you are like that. Some of you can't stand people like me, the morning people. Some, I, I do realize, need a little uh, liquid encouragement in order to have a better day, such as coffee. I remember looking at a, uh, a plaque in a manager's um, office, and it said, today, be amazing. But first, coffee. And many people can identify with that. Today, be amazing. Yes, we're going to 
charge the world. We're going to do all that we know we should do. But first, coffee is served. And many of us know that. But a lot of times, we can control our attitudes, whether they be bad, we can help it to become good. Whether it is a complaining attitude, we can be turned to become thankful. So, the first part is, number one, pray that God, through the Holy Spirit, shows us our sin. Number two is simply to read God's Word. First is to pray. Second is to read God's Word. And there's an amazing thing about God's Word and how great it is for us in this specific thing. In Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 12, it says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful. That means alive and active. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the, th of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You, you see, all these different things are very closely associated with one another, the soul and the spirit. If you're a dichotomist, you believe that the soul and the spirit are one. And then there's the body. If you're a trichotomist, that means you think there's a soul, there's a spirit, and there's a body. If you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, uh, just ask me later and I'll, I'll explain it to you. No problem about that. Joints and marrow. And then it's the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. It shows you where you are before God. The Word of God is quick and powerful. I saw this when I was reading my daily Bible reading in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is an interesting book in that it's about individuals that go back into the promised land after captivity uh, of Babylon. And in chapter 9, verse number 1 to verse number 3, it shows that interesting, uh, interesting aspect about the lives in that, at that point in time. It shows the connection between reading God's word and having confession. Uh, in verse number 1, it says, Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths, and earth upon them. They were mourning. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers, and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. And notice with me, and they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God, one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. The connection's there. The reading of God's law, per, or God's word, God's law, produces an amazing effect on our hearts that if we have a tender heart to God, then it shows us our sin and we then confess it. You need to get in God's word every day. If you think about it, God's word there are two things that you should ask yourself every time that you read God's Word. One, you should ask God, show me yourself in your Word. And He will. The second question to ask is, show me who I am and what I am like. A lot of times it will encourage you in being the Christian that you ought to be. But if there's ever a time that you are sinning before him, then you need to get it right with him and the word of God will show you that. So we see, not only should you pray, not for God to show you what your sin is. Number two, you should read God's word to show you exactly what it is. And number three, you should mourn over your sin. You should mourn over your sin. What do you mean by that, Pastor? You should mourn over your sin. Do you mean I should cry about my sin? Well, that's not a bad idea. In James chapter number 4, verse number 8, it says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. We love that part of the verse, but here's the rest of it. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. 
Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Well, that doesn't sound pleasant, does it? That doesn't sound good at all, but that's the word of God to New Testament believers in Jesus Christ. Why does it why is James written that way? Because you and I we need to come to grips with how terrible sin is in our lives. That if we're a part of something that is sinful, it should cause us to mourn. My definition of mourn simply is to feel bad enough in order to correct it. To feel bad enough over our sin in order to correct it. Okay, what if I don't feel bad about my sin? Two ideas. One, remember, your sin makes you worthy to be punished in hell for all eternity. If you don't feel bad about your sin, realize that one sin that you just committed, you are worthy to be punished in hell for that sin for all eternity. Everything good, gone. Everything that you look forward to, no longer a reality. In this life, we have many things that gets us away from work. We have vacations to look forward to. We have uh, time with friends and family to look forward to. We have hobbies to look forward to. But yeah, every good thing is stripped away if we are punished in hell. Now, praise the Lord, as believers in Jesus Christ, we will never, ever, ever need to be worried about that. But remind yourself, that your sin makes you worthy to be punished in hell. But not only that, more, more sad. Your sin, remember, your sin is what Jesus died for in all the horrors of crucifixion and experiencing God's wrath in your place. Remind yourself that your sin, whatever sin it is you just committed, if you don't feel bad about it, your sin is what Jesus died for in all the horrors of crucifixion. I'm not going to go into all the detail, but just thinking and imagining how it must have been like. There was a film that was done, Passion of the Christ. It's rated R for a very good reason that it tries to show the horror that it was to be crucified with the, the crucifixion of Christ. But it cannot do an accurate job of that. It barely scratched the surface of what agony Jesus had to go through for to pay for the sins of me and you. And more than that, he experienced God's wrath against all sin at one moment in time. And if it was only for one sin in the entire human history, he would have died on the cross for it. Still in a horrifying way. If you don't feel bad for your sin, whatever sin it might be, Remind yourself of these things. There was a song that I really loved when I was a new believer in Christ. When I heard it, it just really resonated with me. It goes something like this. If when I sin, Jesus feels the nails. What if that were true? What if when I, when I fall, they, he hears the crowd Say, crucify once again. If I'm causing him pain, then I know what I have to do because I just can't bear the thought of hurting him. When we sin against God, God is grieved. We should feel bad for it. We should mourn over sin. Let the feeling feeling bad about what you did kind of invade your heart to understand the reality of how bad sin is. 
and then pray, God, forgive me of this sin. Pray, help me, God. Help me to not do this sin again. Help me to know a way to get out of this. Help me to, to have the courage to get rid of this sin in my life. And he will answer that prayer. Mourn over your sin. But no, number four, last but not least, rejoice in the Lord. You might think of me kind of strange right now. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just said to mourn over sin. Is that right? Yes, I did. Then now you're telling me to rejoice in the Lord. Yes, yes I am. How are those two things connected? How do those two things correlate with one another? I'm glad you asked that question. Because if you think about it, there is a close relationship between mourning and rejoicing. In Psalm 30, verse number 5, it says, Weeping may endure for a night. But what? But joy cometh in the morning. Close associated between weeping or mourning. Joy. Weeping. Joy. Weeping. Joy. How, how is that possible? We mourn because we feel bad because we have sinned against Almighty God. We ask Him to forgive us. First John once again says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a promise from God that if we confess, we say the same thing to God about what His Word says about the sin. If we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just what to forgive us our sin. Somebody might ask the question, does He forgive and forget? Well, in it, in an idea, yeah. Now, he, God is absolutely omniscient. So he knows everything. But here's the thing about it. He says, your sin I remember no more. What that means, in my understanding of it, is that he remembers your sin not in the way he, know, he remembers the sin as covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That before a judge, it is no longer something that he can put against you to be remembered on the day of judgment, but rather it is forgiven. He remembers the sin, but he remembers that it's under the blood. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's amazing. The forgiveness of God. When I was in a... In, the, in middle school, I got saved in a computer lab. All my sin and all the guilt that I had because of my sin, and I understood that the wages of sin was death, and I remember and understood what Jesus did for me, I started crying. Crying over my sin. But then when I received Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior, guess what happened? That weight... That burden of guilt and despair got off of me. And I had joy. I had joy for what God had done through His Word. Amazing. We got His Word on the, on the subject matter, and it's done. It's a done deal. If we confess our sin, mourn over our sin, we confess it to Him, He forgives us. So now it's time to rejoice. In what the Lord has done. It reminds me in Nehemiah. Once again I, I was reading through this book. On a daily devotional basis. And there was a point in time. In, in Nehemiah chapter 8. That this very much was the way it happened for the people. In that here's the backstory behind Nehemiah. Uh, the people of Judah disobeyed God. And disobeyed him for a long period of time. And so God corrected them by sending them into the Babylonian captivity with Nebuchadnezzar. After that was done, he said, 70 years you will return to the land. And with a moment's notice, 70 years later, God did exactly what he said he was going to do. Isaiah, he says, Cyrus, 
the king will send you back. And so, historically speaking, Cyrus, the king of Persia, did decree for the people of Judah to go back to the land and to rebuild. And so they rebuilt the temple at first. Nehemiah came back and rebuilt the rest of the city of Jerusalem. And now it's the time, the first time that they all hear God's word being read in the midst of a, of a feast, in the midst of a, 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 a wonderful festival to praise the Lord about. In verse number 8 it says, So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So they, they, they were expositors. They went through the word of God. And says this is what it says. This is what it means. This is how it applies to you. Exactly what they, they did. They exposited the word of God. But with the word of God came conviction. And they started mourning. And in verse number 8, or verse number 9, I'm, I'm sorry. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershaph of the governor of the area, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. They were reminded of the very fact that their fathers messed everything up by transgressing against the law of God and they were now coming back from captivity. Nothing is as it was back then uh, from, from when they came out of captivity, from when they first came into it. And they were weeping and mourning because of what the law said and what their fathers had done. And in verse number 10 it says, then he, that's Nehemiah, said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. Notice this, for this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry. Why? For the joy of the Lord is your strength. When we confess our sins, we rejoice in the goodness of God. God did, need, did not need to save us, but he did. God doesn't need to forgive us, but he does. And we should have joy unspeakable. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's amazing. We need to confess our sins to him. We need to see our sins. We need, need to pray that our sin be found out, that we understand our sin, that we can read God's word and we know specifically where we have gone wrong from him. To mourn over, to feel bad enough to, to repent over it. But then after we confess our sins, he forgives us of our sin and then rejoice. I don't know where you are today, in your Christian walk. Uh, maybe it's been a long time since you liked reading your Bible. I don't know where you are. Maybe it's been a long time since you really enjoyed praying. And getting close with God. And maybe it's been a long time since you ever really feel like you're close with God. My challenge for you today. Each and every day. Begin by getting closer and closer with God. Confess your sins. Rejoice in Him. We will be revived. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for all the wonderful truths that are in your word. Father, help each one of us that are listening and watching this video. Help us to confess the sin that we have before you. Some know what their sin is. Some, they might be ignorant of where they have sinned against you. Father, I pray that you give light to the eyes of those who don't know. Help us to mourn over our sin. 
Help us to confess them to you. Help us to take your word at face value, knowing that you cannot lie. It's impossible for you to lie. We thank you for that. And Father, may we rejoice evermore knowing you have forgiven our sins and to walk closer and closer with you in the newness of life that's in Christ. I do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.